Thanks. Um, so my name is Scott Godinez. Um, I've been doing ministry for a little over 10 years now, which is probably shocking because I know I look like I'm 19. <laughs> but, you know, I got married, got my wife, I got my two girls in the back enjoying their time here, uh, originally from Texas, and, uh, and that's kind of enough about me. Um, man, uh, so excited to get to be here. I love getting to share God's Word. It's one of my favorite things to do. Another one of my favorite things to do is uh, I'm really into cycling. I got really into like riding bikes. Like I like, like riding my bicycle. I got one of those little like skinny tire road bikes, and I wear like the tight shorts, all the whole deal. <laughs> and um, I got to complete a childhood dream of mine a couple of weeks ago, last week actually. When I was a young boy, my dad was big into cycling too, and I remember seeing this picture of him doing this bike race. He did a 100 mile, it's called a century ride, 100 mile bike race. It's like the, the pinnacle thing to do in cycling. If you're a good cyclist, you try to go for that 100 mile bike ride. And I remember as a kid, like, man, I want to do that someday. And so um, for the past couple of years, I've been getting more seriously involved in cycling. And so I got this fancy little bike and the little, I got, I got all the things. And I did what's called the triple bypass. So it sounds like a hard procedure, but it's actually a bike race here in Colorado. It goes from Evergreen all the way to Vail. So it's 110 miles, and then you go over Squaw Pass, Loveland Pass, and then Vail Pass, so triple bypass, so you have three mountain passes. <laughs> All of that climbing, going up the mountains, culminates in about 11,000 feet of elevation gain. So it's kind of like taking your bike and riding halfway up Mount Everest uh, for 110 miles. And so it was, you know, it was fun. <laughs> uh, we started about 6 a.m. in the morning, didn't finish, didn't get to Vail, me and my buddy, till about 5.30 or so. So it's almost 12 and a half hours, 12 hours on this bike, you know, so my, my butt hurt, my legs hurt, my, everything hurt, <laughs> you know, but I'm glad I did it, you know, I made it to the finish line, I was happy to see my wife there, and uh, and it was great, it was great, I still, it's so funny thinking where I started, you know, when I was back, I still remember being a little kid, and getting my first bike, my dad got it for me, he's getting it all set up, the whole deal, and you know, I remember getting on the thing, and just being like, I have got to be one of the greatest, like, kid cyclists of all time, you know, I was like, going through curves, going down my driveway really fast, I told my dad, like, hey, we gotta, we gotta build a ramp, because I'm one of the greatest cyclists of all time, easily, you know, I was taking turns really fast and everything, he was like, yeah, you're doing great, you wanna take off the training wheels now? I'm like, no, you crazy? I'm like, five, you know, I'm like, no, this is why I'm so good, the training wheels are giving me the confidence to go and do all these really cool things. I trust them to hold me up steady. I rely on them to be you know, tight so I can make the cool jumps off the curb, which was a big deal when you're like five, you know, six inches, that, that's yeah. mad air. And I trusted them, I rely on them. They were able to kind of stand in the gap and, and do what I couldn't do, which is balance on my bike or really even ride it alone. And so I was so grateful for that, right? And it's such a funny thing because unlike training wheels, you know, our relationship with God, we're, we're never gonna grow out of our need for him. We're never gonna grow out of our need for him to stand in the gap and fulfill what we cannot do on our own. We're never gonna stop needing to lean on him, rely on him, and depend on him. And though, yes, I grew out of training wheels and I didn't need those for my most recent bike ride, I still needed God probably even more going up those mountains and down those climbs than I did when I started. And here's the message we have this morning. It's a really, really simple truth, but we've got to understand it. It's so important. It's that God wants us to be mature believers, mm -hmm. that we can inherit and enjoy the blessings he has right now and the ones to come for eternity. And if we miss it, then we're missing out on enjoying everything that God has for you, which is like halfway getting experience, which is, which is no fun. So we're going to be in the book of Hebrews. If you have a Bible with you, which I know we have a whole bunch, and it's awesome because I noticed y'all have English Standard Version, which is the same one I'm reading out of. Uh, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 6. If you have your phone, you can just pull up your Bible app or even just Google Hebrews 6 and then scroll down. We're going to be in verse 9. Now, before we start, I want to just give a little bit of just context to the story of the book of Hebrews. It's a really unique book in the New Testament. So Hebrews chapter 6. It's really unique because of all the books in the New Testament. It's one of the few that's written to an established church, much like where we are now. It wasn't just a, a brand new church with people who were, who'd never heard about Jesus before, who just converted. These were second generation Christians. So their families had been Christian, they'd kind of been brought up in it. And they were growing up, and they were trying to learn how to follow Jesus in a society and in a time where people were actively against it. They were trying to bring Jesus 
into the society. It wasn't. A, it was. It was a time where people weren't exactly like, "Yay, Jesus!" Christians were still kind of on the outside. They were still very marginalized and fringe people. Not too dissimilar uh, from where we live now, where it's almost kind of the opposite. Where now it's kind of people are trying to push Jesus out rather than try to bring Jesus in. Where we still have people in society where being a Christian is becoming a little bit more challenging. It's a little less. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't know, welcomed or embraced some of the things that we believe are going to put you in tough conversations with people. And so they would have been dealing with some of the same pressures that we sense in our lives right now, which is, hey, if I, you know, um, a really common one was a lot of Christians, this we'll say this in the Roman church, they wouldn't attend the Colosseum games because they believed it was inappropriate to watch humans be slaughtered, ripped apart for entertainment, you know. Nowadays, uh, we have a variety of other things that Christians might abstain from, saying, hey, we, we believe that's not for us. God's called us to something higher beyond that. People say, it's just TV. It's no big deal. It's just a song. It's just a show. What's the... we, we face these same pressures. So these Christians in this church would have been dealing with, some of them would have been you know, mature believers. Some of them would have been like, I don't really know how much I'm into this. Some had even begun to fall away. So, oh, I'm definitely a Christian, but then something happened, or they just didn't really like it, or it was uncomfortable, and said, that's not really for me, and they're out. Christians have begun to fall away from the faith, fall away from this church. The writer of Hebrews deeply loved them and was very concerned for them. You see, when someone is doing something that is wrong or dangerous or harmful, it would be unloving to just let them continue it, right? It would be unloving to say nothing, to just let them destroy and ruin their lives. And I think sometimes... We've I don't know what I don't know what shifted where now when you disagree with someone that's you automatically hate them um, or you don't care about them or if you if you say something unkind it's because you don't love them. Well, the writer of Hebrews I want to give you this background context. At the end of chapter five in those first eight verses says some incredibly harsh things, what we might call tough love. He he accuses the many of the people in this church of being like babies in the faith when they should be teachers. He says you. You can only drink milk when you should be eating spiritual, solid food. He accuses them of being like, like the land where the rain falls on it, but grows no crop. And it's, it's the, the end result that it grows these thistles and thorns, and it's useful only to be burned. Kind of hinting at a possible future for these people. This is a massive warning and a massive accusation. He essentially says that some of you have even, have even fallen away, and there's no more hope for you, which is a crazy thing for a guy to say. These incredible harsh words, and we're going to catch up where he switches his tone a little bit. But I want us to be honest with ourselves as we go through this. He's, the, the author now is going to begin speaking to some of the more authentic believers, some of the people who have true faith, but they're still going to need some encouragement. Some of them might even be asking themselves, oh man, maybe that's me, maybe he's talking to me. He's like, no, not, I, don't, I don't mean you, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But I want us to be honest with ourselves because God always has something to show us in this word. He always has something to teach us. And I want you to challenge yourself. Be open, be vulnerable, be willing to let this book change your life. If all you ever do is look for stuff that, it, that you agree with, that's not a relationship. If, if this book doesn't have any influence over you, there's no relationship you have with God. If you just look for someone to agree with you all the time, I don't, I don't even know what that is. Like, um, fake? Like, I don't even agree with my wife all the time and I love her. And so, obviously, that a, a perfect God of the universe, I'm not going to agree with every single thing he says to. And I'm probably the one on the wrong. That needs to change. So, as we go through this, I want you to really evaluate and challenge yourself. Where, where do you fall on the spectrum? Where do you fall on the maturity of your faith? Are you over here saying, yeah, I'm, I, I profess Christ, but perhaps you might not actually be that mature in your faith. Perhaps you're still just a baby. And then the better question is, why? Why haven't you grown? Or maybe you're over here you're like, yeah, no, I am totally with Jesus. And you're, you're, you're there. It's part of who you are. Jesus is he saved you. You're a born-again Christian. All the stuff you want to say. But ask yourself, what do I need to do next? What, am I just going to stay here? Or is there something for me to do more? Amen. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. All right, so here we go. Hebrews chapter nine or chapter 6, verse 9 through 12. I'm going to read. There's only four verses, so it's really, really short. Um, I'm going to read through these four, and then we're going to walk back. We're going to walk through them and go through one, each one at a time. Here we go, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, so kind of the, I mean, you can literally look at verse 8. It talks about it's near to being cursed, it ends to be burned. It's talking about the, the land and the people who's like, ooh. So though we're speaking in this way, this really harsh way, yet in your case, beloved, or maybe yours, this is something to our loved one, we feel sure of better things. 
things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay, so kind of simple. It's one of those cool things like you read it like, oh, that sounds nice. You kind of highlight it. There's a lot of depth here. I love it because you could read this to your kid and they could be like, okay, cool. So God doesn't, isn't going to forget you and he wants you to have hope and you know be like the good people. I mean, you could kind of teach that to a kid. That's, that's a good lesson. But we're going to go deeper than that. We're going to go a little more thicker than that. And there's one verse that's going to be a lot. So you have to hang with me. And I'm going to do my best to make it as simple as possible because it was like, whoa, for me even. All right, verse 9. Here we go. So remember, our main point is that, is that the author of Hebrews wants us to be mature Christians who are able to inherit the promises and enjoy the blessings of God. That's what we're trying to get here. We want to be these mature Christians who get to full experience of what God has for us. Our first one, verse 9, true believers will not fall away. There's something really cool in here. He says in verse 9, beloved. Now, beloved is kind of like one of those fancy, like kind of churchy words. Like, I, I mean, maybe my wedding, I was like, my beloved, I do it. Yeah. I don't know when we say beloved. There, it's actually not even in the Greek. If you, if you just look at the word, it's most translated as, I love you. So he's basically saying all these really hard things follow up with, I love you. Like, it's okay for me to say these things because I love you. I'm not being rude. I'm not being mean. It kind of requires us to have a little bit of thick skin. We have to be willing to have these conversational, confrontational sayings and do it with love. He says, I love you. You are loved ones. Because he's like, I'm not, not being rude. Don't think I'm trying to be mean or cruel or condescending. I love you, and that's why I'm saying these things. He's ultimately building up to why he believes these believers will not fall away. The first thing is he realizes they're going to accept this because they know I love them. They are beloved. They are, I love you. You are loved ones. We say hard things to people we love. If someone's doing something dumb and you don't care about them, you kind of just let it happen. <laughs> Wait, you watch this, watch this, watch this. You know, you watch what's about to happen. What do you care? Like, no, don't do that. Watch out. Or on a more serious note, you say, stop. You're going to ruin your life. Amen. Now, if, if you, I work with, Teenagers, I've done youth ministry for a long time. It doesn't always go over so well, but that's why you got to really build and know that it's love. It's not that you're trying to be controlling or condescending or that you know everything and they don't. It's because you love them. And so the author realizes that these Christians are willing, are the type of people who are willing to take hard truths. We're not always like that, especially now our society doesn't like hard truths. We have to, everyone has to be right. Everyone has to be acceptable. People definitely don't like the black and white that sometimes Jesus causes. There's a lot of gray, but there is a, you're with Jesus or you're not, ultimately. That can really upset people. There's, you can't really be halfway. If you don't accept Jesus, you decide, you've essentially rejected him. And that has a consequence and that can offend people. These are tough truths. It, it makes people uncomfortable and we try to avoid that. I mean, how many times have you ever been like, oh, I should, I should ask to pray for this person, or I should tell this person to maybe maybe watch out for them, or I should, I should encourage them, but sometimes we're afraid we might offend them. And so instead of offending them, we just offend God. We're like, instead of doing what God wants me to do, instead of sharing the gospel the way he's called me, I'll just I'll just offend God instead of offending this person. We've, we've elevated fear of offense way, way, way too high. But when you love them, when you love that person, and as Christians, we know that we're loved by God, because this isn't just this man saying this. These are the inspired words of God. This is God saying, I love you then you recognize, what else do you need? Like, call me ugly, call me stinky, call me whatever you want to call me. God loves me. Thank you. And that needs to be enough. If it's not, that's okay. We're growing. We want to be mature to where that is enough. we got to have that thick skin. we got to be able, willing to take hard truths. He says, you are loved ones, and I am sure of better things. In your case, there are better things things that belong to salvation, that accompany salvation. You're going to get these better things. Okay, okay, so here's our question. How do you have such confidence? How do you know that? That's what I would be saying right now. Well, how do you know that, Scott? How do you, where, where are you seeing that? Verse 10, we're going to spend a lot of our time. This is a big, chunky, meaty verse, like one of those John 3, 16 type things, where it's like, for God's love the world, we say, there's so much truth in it. There's a lot of truth in this one. Um, 
hang with me. We're going to go through some really cool stuff. This verse, as I was studying this, preparing to preach this with y'all this morning, um, it really even shaped a bit of how I see God. I was like, man, I never, I didn't know this. It was really, really cool. I love that kind of stuff. I hope it's just as exciting for you as well. Verse 10, here's the thing is, here's the truth, guys. God will not forget you. I hate being forgotten. It's actually one of the few things that makes me mad. I think this is a kid. I think I'm like really, I forgive my dad for it, kind of. <laughs> he like forgot me a couple times and made me so mad. And so like, I hate being forgotten. So I love this truth. God will not forget you. Here we go. Verse 10. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. He's not going to overlook. He's not going to forget it. But here's the word we need to really key in on. This is the one that's going to ch change a lot of how we see our relationship with God. God is not unjust. Now, this is weird, right? Because if we're going to talk about some activity, some trait of God that's going to secure salvation for us, or the better things, the blessings that belong to salvation, we typically don't think justice. We typically don't think God's justice is the first thing that comes to mind. We think, oh, well, if I'm going to get the blessings of salvation or the better things that come with salvation, that's got to be God's love. That has to be God's mercy, God's grace. But God's justice? Like, God's justice, isn't that like the wrath? And like, I'm thinking of that movie Hercules where Zeus stoke lightning bolts, you know? And I'm like, isn't that God's justice where, where he gives us what we deserve? You know, where it's like, oh, you know, God's justice is going to get you kind of thing, you know? Um, but here it's like, no, because God is not unjust. Because God is just, I'm sure of these better things for you. So we got to really break that down and say, well, hold on. Why does the author of Hebrews want us to know that God's justice has any role in him not forgiving us and him helping us to become mature believers who inherit and enjoy all the blessings he has? How do we get there? It's a great, great question. Here's what we're going to see. So that word for, I kind of like, most of the time in the Bible, you can, all, you can change out the word for with the word because, and I just like that better. So again, because God is not unjust, he's going, you're going to get these better things. So the um, though we speak in this way, we feel sure of the better things because God is not unjust, right? So moving forward, here we go. God is not going to forget their ministry and, his, and love for his name. That's a huge part. It says, and love for his name. It's right there in that verse. I'm not going to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints. There's five things we're going to observe here. The first one is that these Christians are doing work for the saints. They're doing some type of ministry for other Christians. Two, they did this because of their love for God's name. Three, God's justice can see it, right? It's not going to be overlooked, which means God's justice, this trait of God, sees this ministry happening and then will not forget it. This not forgetting, God's justice not forgetting what he sees prompts God to work for you. Prompts God to do a work for your perseverance to get those better things. Prompts God to bring you to maturity as a believer. This is why the author is confident that you will persevere and experience better things. So here's where we're starting to get a little more complicated. So I'm going I'm to unpack this a bunch of different ways. God's justice sees the good works reminds God, God then decides to work for your perseverance. But here's the next question we need to ask ourselves. Well, hold on. If this is about works and God doing something with salvation over here, so God sees the works, brings us good blessings and salvation, doesn't that mean that we, gotta, we just do good things and we get salvation? No, not at all. In fact, it's so much better. But here's the thing, quick side note, there are far too many Christians who see it that way who think we need to do all these little you know, steps and do all this stuff to somehow earn God's favor or somehow put God like in debt to us. Um, kind of like whenever you do something nice for somebody, you're like, hey, see what I did for you? So uh, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch mine. It's like this, uh, this weird contractual thing. That's not how God works. It's not somehow that we, it's not that we earned anything and God's justice says, oh, well, in order to do the right thing, um, Scott did A, B, and C, so now I owe him Salvation. It's not that. Don't get caught up in that. That's a stressful way to live. To think I need to do all these right things by God. Because guess what? <laughs> I don't always get it right. 
And that would be a really stressful way to have my salvation based on, I hope I'm doing good enough. Everyone has some standard for living in their life, and it can be stressful if it isn't what Jesus calls to. So let me keep going. So it's not that. God's justice or righteousness, God's justice, him doing the right things, him being just, him being right, is married to God's glory. God is the most right and valuable thing in all of existence. And if he were to do anything or allow anything that would diminish that truth, it would be the most wrong, most unjust thing. You see, if, if you were doing something to the, to, to the glory of God, his justice would want to support it because if he were to allow anything to diminish his glory and his might and his splendor, it would be the most wrong thing because he is the most right thing. God's justice isn't simply giving people what they deserve, it's also his commitment to sustaining and elevating his glory. It is right that his glory is more and more revealed to everyone in all creation. Consider what mighty things God has done for his glory. One, God made us. Uh, to make, I mean, I've yet to meet any organism as cool as humans. Like, everything just kind of works. I don't even know how. Like, I got fingernails for some reason. Like, I don't know. Those just show up. I guess cells work. Um, whenever my wife was pregnant with our first kid, I was just blown away. I'm like, there's like a little human, like, in there, you know? Like, it's just doing stuff. And now it's running around and, like, causes messes and does all sorts of things. And I'm like, how? How do so many things go right? Like, like I have, like, a spinal column and all this stuff's doing the right thing. I have vocal cords, I can make noises, and then y'all can hear them because of stuff in your ear. I don't know. It's, it's crazy that life can exist. God made that, and it reveals how great he is. It's his glory. Further, God made Israel. He gathered these people together and sustained them, helped them to persevere. There has never been a people more likely to be forgotten by history than the Hebrews and Israelites. They've been conquered. They've been exiled. They've been genocide has tried to happen to them multiple times, and yet God has continued to sustain them to his glory. Countless times people prayed in Psalms, God, don't let your enemies prevail so that people will deny and profane your glory. Let us prevail that your glory may be made, made it known. Think about the Hebrews being rescued out of Egypt, right? The, the pillar of fire coming down at night, the cloud guiding them at daytime, or the Red Sea. We sang about it earlier, the Red Sea being parted. The Bible tells us God did this so that, he says, yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. God is absolutely committed to revealing his glory and sustaining anything. <coughs> there was another one, um, I love this, in Acts 5, um, all of these apostles have been arrested, and the council of Pharisees were talking, like, oh, what should we do? You know, we got to shut down this church. And one of the Pharisees stands up and says, guys, if this church, if this new religion, if this Jesus, this Christianity, if it's man-made, it'll fall apart. We don't have to do anything ourselves. It'll, don't even worry about it. But if this is of God, it will be impossible to stop. God wants to reveal his glory through the church. Amen. And his church is a great way God is committed. It is just that his church reveals the glory of God. You see, I love this. We need to be really concerned about God's glory increasing. We sing about it all the time. God, praise be to God. Why? 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 Here's why. When I was a kid, I used to watch these, um, what are they? I don't know what they call them anymore now. But the people on TV who like sell you stuff, they don't do them anymore. Billy Mays was like my favorite guy. He's like, Billy Mays here. But there was this one commercial where I was, I was, sick, I was sick from school. I'm watching TV, and they took a knife, and they cut through, like, the soda can. And he's like, what's this? And then he cuts the tomato, and you're like, look at this little tomato. And he's like, if you order right now, I'll give you this cool knife that cut through the can, cut the tomato, and I'll give you the five-piece steak knife set. But wait, that's not all. There's even more. If you call right now, I'll get you the cool knife. I'll get you the five-piece steak knife, and I'll give you a knife sharpener. And he's like, but wait, guys. I just got a call. My boss said it's okay. Guys, if you call right now, I'll give you the knife that cuts the can, that cuts the tomato. I'll give you the five-piece steak. I'll give you the knife sharpener. And guess what? I'm going to give you a whole other one for free for you and your buddy. This is amazing. And it's just, the deal just keeps getting better and better, you know? It's like, well, shoot, I'm not going to call ever. <laughs> it's like, eventually he's going to come buy my house. And um, it's just it's insane. Like, all of a sudden, you're so excited to, to buy this knife to make this purchase because look how much better it's getting. Every time. God reveals his glory more and more and more to us. You ought to be excited because that's your God. 
That's who's fighting for you. That's who's on your side. That's who you're praying to. And you're like, God, please let this happen. That's the might of your God. That is greater than anything in all of existence. And the more he reveals his glory, the more satisfaction you can have, the more contentment you can have, the more joy you can have, the more pleasure in life and eternity you can have because that's your God. That's his incredible glory. So, yes, we want to see God be justfully committed to his glory. And when God's justice sees this church, sees these Hebrews saying, hey, we want to minister to the saints, to other Christians, because we love the name of God. We love the glory of God being lifted. His justice says, I am for that. They are amplifying my glory. I have to. I have to persevere. I have to uphold them because my glory is at stake. They're doing this for the love of my name and I have to see them prevail. This is huge. You know what this means? That means that God, by his own nature, is committed to you. Let me say it another way. In um, Philippians 1, 6, Paul wrote, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. God made you for his glory, and he has committed himself to continue working and transforming your life for his glory, that more people can see how great he is. God wants to show off how awesome he is through your life. Which I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm totally down with. <laughs> When the glory of God's name is at stake, God's justice will prevail. Amen. One of the best ways to communicate the weight of God's glory is when we put all of our hope in him rather than the things of this world. And that's the fulfillment of what we see in verse 11. Our main point here is that our hope is assured. Verse 11. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness or diligence, be doing the same things, so that you can have full assurance of hope until the end. I love this. This is the process by which we achieve the goal. So, excuse me, the goal is to be mature believers. That's kind of the aim. That's what we're going for. The, the benefit of that is that we get to inherit the blessings and enjoy all of the promises of God. The fuel is right here. We do those things. We have that love for God's name. He's going he's gonna to uphold us. And here's how we get there, by having full assurance. If you see in verse 12, it says, so that. You can even put the, the word in order that. So it's kind of cause, effect. So full assurance of hope leads to that really cool benefit, um, getting to inherit the promises and everything, right? And so having this process is how we achieve the goal. Full assurance of hope is a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. Having full assurance is almost like having a... You ever know play Mario Kart and you get the little star, the little rainbow? Actually, even just Super Mario. And all of a sudden, the music are playing... Doo, 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 and you can just run through like walls and stuff. And like, you're like, this is amazing. Like, you, like, it makes you invincible if you ever play it. It's awesome. In Mario Kart, you can dodge. You can run through the shells and everything. In Super Mario, I think you can run through the blocks and the, the Koombas and all that. Anyway, it's a good game. Um, but it's like having full assurance gives you this like invincibility thing against all doubt and all worry. We need to contrast... Biblical hope with wishful thinking. See, every time I, uh, I buy a lottery ticket, that's wishful thinking. <laughs> Come on, God. I can really use this. This will be great. Um, I don't really know. I'm kind of just hoping it works out. But biblical hope is like the future tense of faith. It's confidence that who God is, who God has been, who God is for you right now, God will be tomorrow. It's because it's a hope that says, I hope in the name of God this will happen. And it's a conviction and a confidence that it will come to pass. I hope for heaven in my life or when I die. And that's not a lottery ticket like, oh, I hope these are the right numbers. Oh, please, 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 please. You know, or like when you turn the car, I'm like, please start this one. Please just, turn. you know, like you're like almost bargaining with fate or something. See, Christians, we don't have to, that's not how we live. The world can live that way if that's what they want. We don't want them. We want them to know this. We want them to know hope. Biblical hope that is faith in the future. That is confidence of what God has done, which we can read about, which you know about because you've experienced it, believer. You know what God's done for you. And that faith is hope, is future tense that he's going to do it again. He will do it again in the future. And that liberates you. That frees you up. It's like having that little superstar where you can just run through all the doubts and worries and anxieties of life. 
Imagine if God guaranteed to give you whatever you asked for. He's like, hey, I'll 100% give you whatever you want right now. What are you going to pray for? I hope you, may, I hope you go big. I hope you go real big. Like a billion dollars? Nah, that ain't big enough. You got to go bigger than money. Because money, it fades away. It disappears. People lose money overnight. Or you could just die and then we'll get his money. I hope you go big. If you were guaranteed, you had full assurance that whatever you asked for was going to happen, what would, you, what would you ask for? What would you do? One of the ways people like to say it is, if you knew you weren't going to fail, what would you what would you attempt? What would you go after? You see, in this life, as a husband, as a father, God has made it clear I need to lead my family. And if I'm leading my family out of fear, I don't know what if this happens. I'm not going to do a great job. See, there's people I love whose lives are at stake, whose livelihoods are at stake. And if I don't lead well, if I'm not leading in the confidence and the truth of God's word, I I don't know what could happen. I feel like when choices are made out of fear, they're usually not good choices. Some of the worst things in our history, in American history, are because people had fear. World history in general, people often fear what they don't know. Um, I didn't have steak until my senior year of high school because I was afraid it was going to taste yucky. And what a mistake that was. Same with cheesecake. Man, totally, those are bad choices. Now, I love cheesecake now. Like, I wish I would have tried it sooner. Don't make choices out of fear. You know what is an antidote to fear? Faith. A conviction of hope that God's going to do something for you in the future. Not just something, but something good. He's working for you. Christian. He wants to show off his glory in your life. This is where we get our next step. In verse 12. We have that full hope. We're confident. So now what? How do we get to those? How do we get to inherit those blessings? We we, we feel sure that as a mature believer, God's gonna hold us. We're gonna persevere. We're not gonna fall away. We know we're one of the one of the, one of the mature believers. God has us in his hand. We're good. We've seen it. He's proven that to us because of his justice. He's committed to his glory. We believe that. We have all this hope. All right, we're ready to go. What do you want us to do? Have these things so that. There's one final warning. You may not be sluggish, so don't be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So really quick, we have to talk about that final warning. Don't be sluggish. You know what a slug is? Slugs don't really do much. They're really slow. The better translation of that is don't be slow in learning. Don't be one of these Christians who's just kind of coasting along. If all you do is show up once on a Sunday, listen to some guy talk for 30 minutes, then you forget what you knew, go back home and do your own thing, you're in danger of being sluggish. You might be totally saved. You might be a mature believer, but for some reason, you're just kind of sticking there. You're not really doing anything. You're sluggish. Slugs move, but almost not even marginally at best. You're not growing. And if you're not growing closer to God, here's the reality. You're drifting. You see, I love my wife, but I'm always going to be drifting from her, no matter what. If I'm not actively saying to her, how can I romance you? How can I love you better? Then I'm, 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 I'm always going to be drifting away. People, it's called, scientists call the word entropy. Things are always trying to move out of order. If no one cuts the grass on your lawn, it's going to go crazy. We have to actively be working toward things. You don't just accidentally become a Christian and drift toward God. Something changed. Something transformed you. And in any good relationship, if you just sit there, you don't call, you don't text, you don't hang out, you're not going to be friends anymore. You have to put something into a relationship. You have to love this person. I love the saying, there's a, a, a little quote about this, this old married couple and the, you know, the guy's driving the truck you know, and, and the wife's over here and she's got her arms crossed and she's like, honey? He's like, yep. She's like, how can we never talk and love like we used to when we were young and sit real close? And he's like, I ain't the one who moved. <laughs> but dang, you know, but the reality is we naturally drift away. We need to be actively growing closer and so we don't want to be sluggish challenge yourself 
Be in God's word. If, you're, if this is hard to read, then, then find someone to help you go through it. Um, are, you, are you allowing Christian music to infiltrate your car, your, your phone? Are you listening to things? Are you watching things that are going to encourage your faith? Or are you doing things that are going to pull you away? These are pragmatic choices you can make in your life. Am I doing things that are going to draw me closer to God? Or am I doing things that create more space and I'm sliding away? What is the characteristic of your life defined by? Actions that draw you closer or things that pull you away? Right now, you're doing things that draw you closer. You chose to show up here. There's a thousand different things you could have been doing. You said no to a lot of things so you could be here right now. And there's a lot better people who are better at preaching than me, um, more exciting than whatever. But you said, I want to be here because God matters in my life. It's like taking a two-by-four and adding it to the wall of your faith. And every time you come up in church, you add another two-by-four, strengthening that wall. Every time you come to Bible study, you're adding another two-by-four. Every time you pray with someone, every time you skip that movie that you know you shouldn't watch because it has that one scene in it, and you know if you watch that scene, you're going to make some bad choices tonight. Or you put down that book, you know you shouldn't be reading that book because it makes you think stuff. Or you call that person, and you're like, I shouldn't be calling that person. You're stepping closer to God. You're, you're stepping closer to God. It does require imitating the ones who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Guys, I'm going to try and speed up a little bit. Faith and patience, basically trust and belief. Faith, let's call that belief. Patience is trust. Um, you, you have to have both. You can't have one without the other. If you have faith in God but no trust, that's a shallow relationship. You see, trust influences how you act. If I believe there is a rock, a giant boulder suspended above my head, and in three seconds it was going to drop and squish me, then I, I, I trust that that's going to happen. I'm going to move out of the way because I don't want to die. Trust influences how you act. If you have faith in God but no trust in him, you're not going to change anything. And yeah, I believe in you, but so? If you have trust but no faith and you don't have faith in God, then all of a sudden you become naive and vulnerable. You're, or in other words, gullible. You believe in all sorts of random things. One of my friends, I remember, I love teasing about this, um, Actually, let me back real quick. I was at King Supers, and this dude pulls up to me, and he's like, hey, man. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And he's like, hey, so I was doing a basement remodel with my company, and we, we had a bunch of extra um, sound systems left over. They're like worth $2,000, but I'll sell you one. And I'm like, I got a dollar. I know. I, first of all, we we're trying to make a sound system deal. It didn't make sense at all. And we're in King Supers parking lot, and he has like a van. And I'm like, this doesn't seem right at all. And I'm like, well, I don't trust you. I definitely don't believe you. And uh, he's like, no, no, I can't do it for a dollar. I'm out. I'm like, okay, bye. Well, I come home. My roommate's like, bro, you'll never guess what happened. And I was like, what? He's like, do you all the King Supers? I was like, no way. <laughs> he was at like, different King Supers. And this is a true story. Um, he's like, all the King Supers. And this guy came up to me. He was telling me he was doing a basement remodel project. And his company had a leftover, like, sound system. And, dude, it was two grand. I bought it for 300 bucks. What a deal. And I was like, no. <laughs> so we plugged it in. It was, a, <laughs> it was the worst sound. It was like a total, total scam. He believed in a false truth. We have to have the right faith in God plus trust. Otherwise, you're trusting in all these crazy things that are going to make you look like a fool. You, you will be a fool at the end of days. There will be gnashing and gnawing at the door, but Jesus says. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. Put your faith in God, not all these other things around us. Amen. We have to have faith and patience. Imitate them. Imitate the ones who have these things, and we can inherit the promises of God. I think about um, Joshua, who had faith in God, trusted him, had patience. God said, march seven days. For seven days, march around the city of Jericho. Seven days? Like, that's, I, gotta, I gotta wait a week. Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a military guy. Let's just go fight. He's like, God's like, be patient. Trust me. Have faith in me. So they march around. On the seventh day, march seven times. Then shout the walls will fall. Guess what? They shout the walls fell. Faith. And patience. Another one is um, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. Joseph. <laughs> Joseph was this you know beloved son, and then all of a sudden he's thrown into a pit. Then he's hiding. He's purchased as a slave, and then he's doing great as a slave. And then the wife tries to hook up with him, and he's like, "It wasn't me." And then the wife's like, "He tried to attack me." And so he's thrown in jail. And then in jail, he he, he moves up the ranks. And he's a big deal in jail. And then all of a sudden, this guy's like, he talks to this dude. He's like, "Hey." Tell the Pharaoh that I'm, 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 I'm innocent. I'm not guilty. I shouldn't be in here. He's like, I won't forget you. And then he forgets him. The entire time, Joseph never sinned against God. He never said, God, I, I give up on you. You're wrong. He continued to have faith and a lot of patience, ultimately culminating in this really cool saying in Genesis 51 where he says, 
to his brothers who started this whole thing, who sold him into slavery and tried to have him killed. He says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good and the saving of many. Amen. Have faith, have patience, trust in God, have faith in God, and you can inherit the blessings of God. That same story, that boy, Joseph, grew up and was able to save his entire family and all of the Hebrews from a massive famine because he was a big deal. He was second in command in Egypt. That's incredible blessings. I, For me, I think about the blessings and the promises I want for my family right now, for the kind of man I need to be to make sure that my wife and I have a God-honoring marriage, to make sure that I can be a dad to my little girls. I, I've seen so many dads not do it, and I don't want to be like that. So I need the blessings. I need the promises of God. I want it. I hope you want it. You see, as Christians, we don't have to live our life with uncertainty, wondering what's going to happen. We have the full assurance, our faith, and the hope of God that you are, you will be held in his hand and not, no one will snatch you. You have that. So what do you do with it? You imitate those with faith and patience. Let's take the next step. Have that assurance. Be willing to follow God in anything he calls you to. Because guess what? You have the full assurance of hope. If he calls you to a ministry, you're ready to serve. Maybe he calls you out into the water and you're like, God, oh, I'm not sure how this is going to work. But you trust in faith and hope that he's going to be there with you. And you step out into the water. You step out into your comfort zone. You pick up the phone. You have that tough conversation you're afraid to have. And you trust that God has already orchestrated what's going to happen in the future because you have that assurance of hope. Hope is faith in the future, right? Your confidence is going to happen. Live, move, love, and spread the gospel with the full assurance of that faith and that hope. That's what Jesus wants for us. That's what he's called us to, and that's what Jesus did on the greatest level possible. Even to a cross, he died for us. And the blessing and promise that we, we get to have because of that is infinite. Let me pray for us really quick. God, thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, thank you for... Uh, reminding us and encouraging us that as mature believers, Lord, even if we're, we feel like maybe we're not doing it right, that, that because we love your name, because we love your glory, your justice will uphold us. You will help us persevere. We will not fall away. Even if we feel like it, we trust in your word more than our feelings. Lord, remind us to not be sluggish, but to be excited about diving into your word, excited to be praying, excited to minister to the saints, to other Christians, that we can continue to imitate those who through faith and patience inherited the blessings and the promise. Lord, we want to be like these people who trusted you, obeyed you, and got to experience the pure satisfaction of your love. God, as your glory is revealed greater and greater to us, let us not keep it here. Let us not keep it just in this room. Lord, uh, here on the walls it says we are a people, a church that glows in the dark. Lord, let us take our light and let it shine then, God. And as that verse says, let it shine so that the world may glorify your name. Lord, we want them to see how good you are, how great you are, that you are supreme over any other pill or strategy or self-help book or a thing that they can buy, that, Lord, you are infinite. Everything else is a fading wind. Lord, use us, break our hearts for those who you love, and help us to reach out and give us the excitement to go tell them about how great you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.